the pleasure of introducing one of our ETSU attendings, Dr. Thomas Olmsted. Dr. Olmsted has two bachelor's degrees, uh, one from the University of Mississippi and the other from Louisiana State University, which upon he received his medical degree also from LSU. He is a commissioned officer for the United States Navy and uh, has joined our staff, I believe, has it been a year now? <laughs> In, okay, so a year, <laughs> um, so since June. Um, so anyway, so here he is. He'll be presenting on The Wanderer, and please let's uh, give Dr. Olmsted a warm applause. All right, thank you, Jean. Welcome, everyone. Um, I, I really got excited about this topic. I had forgotten my neuroanatomy um, so I read extensively on the vagus nerve. Um, it is nicknamed the Wanderer. And I had planned to uh, show a video of Dion singing the Wanderer. I don't, the older folks may remember that. But uh, that would be a copyright infringement. So we'll have to skip that one for today. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to have a pretest. So either write down or think in your head what the answers to these questions. Uh, the first one is a true-false. 90% uh, of the vagus nerve fibers are afferent, in other words, from the body to the brain. Number two, the vagus nerve is also called the pneumogastric nerve. And the third one, uh, this one you have to think a little more on, the vagus nerve innervates the A, heart and lungs, B, the reproductive organs in the female, and bladder. Number D. All right. That one. Did, it, did anyone get that? <laughs> All right. So, um, laughter truly is the best medicine. Uh, laughter is contagious. The brain triggers a laughter response and fosters closeness with others and a sense of well being. Laughter reduces the stress response. When you laugh, it contracts the muscles and increases blood flow and oxygenation. Laughter boosts immunity. It may actually increase natural killer cells. Uh, Lee Burke at Loma Linda has studied this. Laughter increases resilience. Laughing at mistakes allows us to recognize that making errors is part of being human. Laughter combats depression, dopamine and endorphins which cause the production of nitric oxide, are increased when we laugh. So, um, the subject of today's talk is the wanderer, the vagus nerve in psychiatry. The vagus nerve is a remarkable nerve that affects every moment of our day. It is the tenth cranial nerve, also known as the pneumogastric nerve. It wanders like a vagabond. It is primarily responsible for the parasympathetic nervous system, and we will return to that in a moment. We will start with a brief review of gross anatomy with the familiar mnemonic, med students will remember this, on old Olympus towering top, a Finn and a German view to hop. There are many variations of that, but that's the one that I remember. Um, this is the first cranial nerve, the olfactory, and those are the olfactory bulbs, then the optic nerve, the oculomotor, the trochlear, the trigeminal, three branches, the abducens, and these are all paired as you see, the facial nerve, which is very interesting, and we'll get back to that one in a little bit too. The auditory nerve, auditory, the stibulococular is the preferred term, the glossopharyngeal nerve, the vagus, which is the topic of today's talk, and the accessory or spinal accessory nerve, and finally the hypoglossal. <clears throat> uh, 
All right, the olfa olfactory nerve is responsible for the sense of smell and also taste. As you might guess, uh, the turkey vulture is probably one of the most sensitive creatures on the earth as far as smell, and they have an extremely large olfactory bulb. <clears throat> and the way that they discovered this about vultures is through natural gas leaks. And natural gas does not really have an odor. It's odorless, but they add mercaptopurines, which sort of smell like rotting flesh, and when there's a gas leak, the vultures start circling, and they can tell you where the gas leak is, where they arrive. <clears throat> so, the optic nerve is the second cranial nerve. It's responsible for the, to sense light. It passes through the optic foramen as it travels to the eye. It transmits visual information, including light brightness, color perception, and visual acuity. It causes the pupils to dilate and constrict and changes the lens to adjust for distance of an object. Only limited re regenerative ability. So the third cranial nerve is the oculomotor. It controls uh, eye movements and the iris uh, and pupillary response. It is primarily an efferent nerve and innervates skeletal muscles in the eye. If damaged by disease, such as diabetes or trauma, it can cause oculomotor palsy. Paralysis of the nerve causes pupillary dilation. So if you see somebody with a blown pupil, you may suspect the oculomotor nerve damage. <coughs> and paralysis causes, also causes Ptosis and down and out movement of the eye, of the affected eye, because they're paired, so it can be on one side. <clears throat> the fourth cranial nerve is the trochlear nerve. It controls eye movements down and out. This is a very clever design, if you'll permit me. Um, the, uh, it, it's from the Greek meaning pulley, which is a trochlea in the Greek, it only innervates one muscle, the superior oblique, and it goes through this pulley device to move the eye. It's just extraordinarily interesting how that works. <clears throat> it exits from the rear of the brain stem, and injury can cause double vision and the, the eye drifting upward. <clears throat> All righty, the fifth cranial nerve is the trigeminal nerve. It innervates the facial muscles. <clears throat> it is the largest cranial nerve, has three divisions, responsible for the sensation of the face, movement of the jaw and ear. Uh, the three branches are called the ophthalmic, the maxillary, and the mandibular. If injured, it can cause trigeminal neuralgia. All right, the six cranial nerves controls the eye movements away from the nose. <clears throat> and here's a schematic of that nerve. <clears throat> All righty. <clears throat> this one is a little hard to see because it's not contrasted well. Um, but the facial nerve uh, is the seventh cranial nerve. Motor nerve for facial expression, sense of taste on the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, uh, and sensations in the outer ear. And we're going to come back to that one, too, as it's fairly fascinating, the research that's going on about that. Also has parasympathetic innervation to the salivary glands. It increases secretions. And when you see someone with Bell's palsy, it's a paralysis of the facial nerve. All right, the auditory nerve, cranial nerve number eight, is responsible for hearing and balance. <clears throat> so number nine is the glossopharyngeal nerve, responsible for swallowing, taste, ear, tongue, and even blood pressure. 
is from uh, let's see it um, cause it regulates blood pressure in the carotid sinus and it causes the pharynx to elevate during swallowing and it causes the parotid gland to secrete saliva it also causes the gag reflex and I don't know how this fella kept from gagging but uh, that's a sword swallower Alrighty, number 10 is the subject of today's talk, the vagus nerve. Uh, again, it's called the pneumogastric nerve, but it basically innervates every major organ in the body. Uh, so it's a, it pulls a heavy duty there as far as regulating things in, in the body. Uh, number 11 is the sensory accessory nerve. It's responsible for head and shoulder movement. <coughs> And it, ha it innervates just two muscles, the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius. So that's where you get the shrug sensation from. And lastly, the 12th cranial nerve, the hypoglossal, it controls movements of the tongue. Uh, and it also is responsible for speech and swallowing. The hypoglossal, of course, means under the tongue. All right, so which um, organs does the vagus nerve innervate? <clears throat> well, the tongue, the larynx, the heart, the lungs, esophagus, the stomach, the liver, the spleen, kidneys, but not the adrenals, the pancreas, the small bowel, and, and the large bowel, and the sex organs in the female. Not so much the male. <coughs> Now, the autonomic nervous system is in perfect balance if you're healthy. Uh, it pits the parasympathetic nervous system against the sympathetic. And you can think of this as uh, a brake or gas pedal. The sympathetic puts the gas on, parasympathetic is the brake. Um, probably some of the younger folks don't even know what this other pedal is for. Um, not many cars today have a clutch, but that, you get that for no extra charge. <laughs> now, the uh, ancient yogis called the vagus nerve the Kundalini serpent. And that's, that's what he looks like. It reaches from the colon, which is the root chakra, to the brain called the crown chakra. It is the rest and digest nerve. And it also works in concert with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal complex. It is responsible for neurogenesis and increases BDNF, a brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is fertilizer for the brain. <coughs> it is easy to see why it's called the pneumogastric nerve because it covers such a, a large part of the body. And it's also easy to see where the term gut feeling came from. Now this pretty lady is Emma Mackey, and she is quoted to have said, people usually think with their brain or go with their heart, but a good place to start is if you have a gut feeling. So, and when you receive 90% of the innervation from the gut to the brain, we get a whole lot of information from our bodies. <clears throat> so we're going to focus on selected branches of the vagus and the application to psychiatry. I love this guy. You're going to see a few birds during the talk. 
All right. So um, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, if it is damaged due to surgery or tumor or other injury, you will become hoarse. And you may have encountered this uh, during your uh, med medical school training. <clears throat> Now, the cardiac plexus uh, does several duties, but I, I found this very interesting that uh, if you, during heart transplant, they de-innervate the heart, so it has no nerve innervation, and is primarily parasympathetic. So when you put the healthy heart into the, uh, and replace the damaged heart, <coughs> the uh, resting heart rate is going to increase because there's no parasympathetic to oppose that. <clears throat> All righty. Uh, the pulmonary plexus allows the lungs to breathe via acetylcholine. And it's thought that these Botox um, injections that folks are getting now may interrupt some anticholinergic, anticholinergic um, production. The esophageal plexus. Uh, this guy is a corn snake, uh, or it's also called a red rat snake. These are beautiful snakes, if you, if you like snakes. <laughs> um, they also come in other shades of red and orange. Uh, the ones that uh, we had down in, uh, in Georgia were more reddish, but just a beautiful snake. And you can see he's eating a rodent there, and if we didn't have snakes, we'd probably be over, overrun with mice and rats. So they, they kind of cull those for us. It's important in swallowing, gag reflex, and coughing. <clears throat> All right, the gastric branches increase gut motility, peristalsis, and stomach acidity. Dysfunction can cause GERD, obesity, and gastroparesis. It's also responsible for satiety. All right, there's also the splenic branches, the renal plexus, the pancreatic uh, branches, which regulate insulin secretion and glucose homeostasis. So you can see this, this nerve has a lot of duties. Uh, the celiac plexus also helps with glucose balance via the gallbladder. And the renal plexus helps balance sodium. The um, branches to the gut, to the small and large intestines, uh, are very intimately involved with uh, irritable bowel syndrome. <clears throat> All righty. I, I want to um, go on to some current research that's happening now. Uh, one of the most interesting things, and I, I hadn't heard about this until about a year ago, but it's been going on for a while, uh, is fecal transplant. And Clostridium difficile is one of the most uh, antibiotic resistant organisms and very difficult to treat. A lot of times antibiotics just don't work. So some bright person decided that they would do a fecal transplant and take healthy stool and introduce it into the colon and it would wipe out the bad bacteria. So you'd have someone with the good bacteria and it would replace the bad and it would cure the C. difficile. Uh, this is also called um, bacteriotherapy. It's usually performed by colonoscopy, but there are other ways that I won't get into right now, uh, which are advanced through the entire colon. Donor stool is delivered via the colonoscope and then slowly withdrawn, you go all the way up to the top of the colon. It restores the healthy microflora and is 90% effective against C. difficile. Now this method, you would, you, you would think is a modern thing, but it's, it's actually been going on since the fourth century China. And it was used to treat food poisoning and severe diarrhea. It was first used in the United States in 1958 to treat pseudomembranous colitis. And at that time they used fecal enemas. And the first stool bank was set up in, at MIT in 2012. Bet you didn't know there was a stool bank. 
<clears throat> uh, research is underway to see if it's useful in other illnesses like colitis, irritable bowel, and even MS. Now, this is in the mainstream news. This is actually an article from last week in uh, the Bristol Herald Courier. And the question for these doctors, I've been on a few different medications for depression, but none of them did much of anything. A friend keeps going on about psychobiotics, which to me doesn't even sound like a real word. What is he talking about? Well, I'm not going to read the whole article to you, but one of the paragraphs is central to this. It says, new research shows that the makeup of the gut microbiome plays a significant role not only in mental health, but in cognition as well. The channel of communications runs both ways. The gut influences the brain, and the brain influences the gut. One theory is that the vagus nerve, which runs from the brain to the gut, acts as an information highway with messages traveling in both directions. Some scientists have referred to the gut as our second brain. Isn't that something? All right, well, what about uh, chronic fatigue syndrome? Uh, the syndrome is somewhat controversial. I guess some people don't even believe it exists. It's a real entity. However, it is characterized by, I mean, patients do have um, symptoms, but whether it's due to some uh, un unknown illness, we're not sure. It's characterized by extreme fatigue. It limits a person's ability to carry out normal daily tasks. And there's currently no cure and no diagnostic test for it. However, a fellow at Tufts, um, his name is Van Elzeker, has a the vagus nerve infection hypothesis, and he speculates that a virus attacks the vagus nerve, which is an immune conduit to the brain, and suspect viruses include Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, and herpes virus. <clears throat> So, these are some of the symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, see, they're, they're pretty nebulous here. Uh, brain fog, sinus problems, swollen glands, sore throat, stomach pain, light sensitivity, heat shocks and chills, unrefreshing sleep, and muscle and joint pain. So, a lot of people have those things, you know. So, do, do we all have chronic fatigue syndrome? <laughs> Certain days, I've probably got most of those. <clears throat> Alrighty. <clears throat> now, um, I, I want to move on to a, a very interesting device that actually does have FDA approval. Uh, it's for treatment resi resistant epilepsy and treatment resistant depression. So this is currently in use for both of those. And this device is uh, implanted under the skin. It's a surgical procedure. Uh, it's placed on the, usually the left chest and it attaches to the left vagus nerve. <clears throat> so it's uh, the vagus nerve stimulators tried after usual medication therapies have failed as well as uh, TMS and ECT. Uh, <clears throat> so this is a, like a pacemaker like device. <clears throat> So small, small electrical impulses are produced, which regulates mood. And the results of a five-year study published in the American Journal of Psychiatry in uh, 2017, studies showed that it, in adjunctive VNS, the group response rate was 68% versus 41% in the treatment as usual group. The APA recommends VNS if a patient has failed four adequate trials of depression treatment. What about Parkinson disease? Does Parkinson disease start in the gut? This is discussed in neurology in an article from 2017, and it uh, discusses a Swedish registry study, suggestive evidence that truncal but not selective vagotomy is protective against Parkinson's disease. Well, how in the heck does that work? 
it was 40% lower risk of Parkinson with the truncal vagotomy. Now, you wouldn't do that proactively, but if someone had to get a, a vagal uh, truncal vagotomy, then you can follow them up later if they have to get it for other reasons. Uh, Louis, uh, so yeah, a possible mechanism. Louis pathology may start in the gut and spread by a prion-like mechanism to the substantia nigra via the vagus nerve. Uh, this is discovered by Brocky and others. Uh, at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, they anal analyzed the gut microbes of Parkinson patients and compared them with people without disease, and there were marked differences. So, all right. And uh, another study, uh, a pilot study of 14 patients with rheumatoid arthritis showed after 12 weeks that two-thirds had significant improvement with DNS. Also curious. All right, there is actually a much less invasive form of vagus nerve stimulation. It's an external device. And here we're getting back to the uh, auricular branch of the vagus nerve, which is superficial. It's in the ear. It's in the center of the ear. Actually, see where this device is placed. <clears throat> it has been used in autism, tinnitus, migraine, epilepsy, depression, and possibly many other illnesses. All this is early. There's only been small studies, so uh, nothing uh, definitive has been studied yet. It is currently in use in the UK, uh, but the United States is, it does not have FDA approval for this external device. But you can still get the surgery. <clears throat> All righty. So, uh, the, uh, this is the non-scientific part of the talk. Um, probably many people in here do uh, yoga or other uh, meditation forms. There are ways you can increase your vagal tone. Uh, cold exposure, uh, like taking a cold shower or drinking cold water, can actually stimul stimulate the vagus nerve. Breathing exercises, and I I think uh, most of the residents know about deep breathing exercise and encourage patients to do that. Uh, yoga and Tai Chi, singing and chanting, meditation, uh, and then focus on positive social connections, laughter, um, exercise, massage, and acupuncture. <clears throat> probiotics, and omega-3 fatty acids. <clears throat> All right, so this is my favorite bird, actually. Uh, when I was uh, practicing in New Orleans, we'd, we'd get to see them twice a year when they would uh, pass through, and there'd be flocks of these birds, and they, they eat on the way south and back north again. Uh, they're very pretty, and they have a, a sweet little chirp. Um, I'd like to end with a quote by Cora Harris, and she was an early 20th century uh, writer from Georgia, very well known at the time, and she wrote the book that they based the movie I'd Climb the Highest Mountain on. I don't, that's an old movie, so I don't know if you've seen that one or not, but uh, pretty good movie. And she says, the bravest thing you can do when you're not brave is to profess courage and to act accordingly. All right, here's your post-test. Everybody get these right? 90% <laughs> of the vagus nerve fibers are afferent. And I, I chose that because I think that's one of the most interesting things about the vagus nerve is a lot of the information goes up to the brain and not as much down. Uh, I've never heard it called the pneumogastric nerve, or I don't remember that from medical school, but that, that is true. And it does innervate all of those things, the heart, lungs, reproductive organs in the female, and bladder, and the digestive tract. All righty, we, we do have some time for questions, so don't make them too hard.
Well, I, I uh, did not mention that um, when I was telling the story about severing of the uh, uh, olfactory nerve, uh, someone in my household had that happen to them, so it's not totally unusual. Um, you can, if you happen to slip and even hit the back of your head, you get a contra coup blow, and it just basically cuts the olfactory nerve, and you have instant loss of sense of smell and taste, of course. Um, but that's, we, we had to learn that from the neurosurgeon about how that even occurs, uh, where you instantly lose your sense of smell. All right. Anybody? Who has the Vegas nerve story? <clears throat> Any questions? Or did I put everybody to sleep? Hold on. <laughs> Who has a panda joke? <laughs> so I had a patient this week actually who had factor five lied and had blood clots and it actually affected his vagus nerve. He's now partially part of his diaphragm's paralyzed and he has gastroparesis. And they're, they're talking about sending him to the Cleveland Clinic to get a nerve stimulator for it. Uh -huh. But the interesting thing to me is that he's, aside from adjustment issues with all of his health problems because of it, he actually seems to be improving as far as his mental health goes. So is there any, any evidence that maybe vagotomy could actually help? Help with uh, the symptoms he has? Well, with, with depression, with anxiety, with mental health. Yeah. Uh, the the vagus nerve does have some ability to regenerate too. Uh, people that have had uh, stomach surgery, it, it can uh, regrow to an extent. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, the application of psychiatry is fascinating, especially with, with this external ear stimulator. I mean that somehow gets back up to the brain, the brain stem actually. That's where all the cranial nerves originate from. So uh, maybe we'll be prescribing those to our patients one day. Uh, or, you know, I don't know if um, stool replacement therapy is done here or not. Does anybody know that in the area? Seems like it wouldn't be that difficult to do if you could talk a surgeon into doing it. Or a gastroenterologist, I suppose. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank All you right. very much for your attention, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Olmstead. <laughs>